Hello and welcome to part three in Ring Central's webinar series, The Future is Calling, How to Keep in Touch with Tomorrow's Work Needs. Now today, we're taking a look at the customer experience and how organizations can set themselves up for success with the right communication strategy. Now I'm Andy Spence, an independent workforce strategist, and I'll be your host throughout this futuristic journey. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Brian Allen, the Associate VP of Integrated Marketing at Ring Central, and Rachel Proven, VP of Customer Success at Proven Success. So thank you both for joining us today. Now let's start with some introductions. It'd be great if you could tell us who you are, what you do, and a little bit about your journey. So welcome, Rachel. Hi, thank you so much, Andy. It's great to be here. Um, well, like you said, Rachel Provan, my company Provan Success helps uh, new customer success leaders transition from individual contributor to manager, learning strategy, people management and work life balance. Uh, and I've been in customer success and support for 16 years uh, with the last 14 in leadership. And I've worked at, you know, uh, huge public companies, little startups, little startups that turned into big companies. Uh, and right now I'm just really enjoying the, uh, the coaching aspect. But to me, putting together uh, new customer success models is just so much fun. It's like a puzzle. Well, it's great to have you today. And we can draw on so much experience there from, from your background. <laughs> and uh, hi, Brian. Hi, Andy. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm the Associate Vice President of, of Integrated Marketing for Ring Central. So I'm passionate about SMBs and how technology can play a part in the way they do business and how they can improve what they're doing with technology. It's what drives me and what makes me happy and what I have found passion for. No, that's great. And we can draw on that. I mean, my, my passion is using technology to build better organizations. And that leads me on to the first question today. Uh, we've incorporated technology into so many aspects of our business, but the data shows that the human element is still crucial for a positive customer experience. Why do you think this is? Rachel? Well, um, you've got the issue that I believe the statistic is 97% of communication is nonverbal. And when you have something like a text or a chat, you're missing all of that context. So if you've ever had a situation where you've texted someone just like, okay, and they think you're mad at them, uh, imagine how that is in your personal life and then think of it magnified by business. So when the conversation really needs to be kept on task and people need to understand each other's tone, it still really helps to be human to human. Um, I like to say that, uh, Customer success and, and business works very well, and automation works very well, but those pesky humans always mess it up. So. <laughs> that, that, that's so true. And we, we miss out on all that nonverbal information uh, to understand where the other person is. Um, no, that, that's great. And Brian, do, do you agree? I certainly agree. I think there's an element of trust that comes from a, a human to human interaction. Yeah. I think automation is fantastic and it can improve speed and all those types of things. But when there is an issue, humans trust other humans to get it done and fixed and figured out. And I think that's the big part of it. No, that's crucial, isn't it? And picking up on all the information we can to understand where the other person is, to trust them uh, and to make, make decisions around, you know, whatever customer service uh, is being delivered. And that's great. And our new customer journeys are different from the past, certainly whether we're deploying omni-channel or focusing on mobile technology. But what are the biggest ways that you've seen the customer journey change over the last few years? Rachel? That's a really interesting question because there's always kind of a pendulum, right, with this, where it started out really high touch, and then in the more recent years, it's moved to the scale, automated, almost all tech touch, and now it's starting to come back the other way. Hopefully at some point we get to a happy medium, but I think people started to realize that something was really lacking in that one-to-many approach. It's great for a lot of things, but as you said, Brian, when trust is involved, uh, that's really when you need a human there. 
So I did, I have seen a lot more automation. I think the idea that we need to come to is automation for the day to day, but not necessarily for escalation or upsells or things like that. You know, if you're on the phone and something is wrong, it feels like things are going into the void uh, if you don't get a human. So I'm seeing it swing back more that way with the additional option to have the chatbot, to have uh, a resource center. So you think it's a case of us getting smarter about um, choosing which interactions are best for which kind of service? Yeah, it's about being strategic. And it's also yeah. about understanding that people have different communication preferences. Yeah, absolutely. And do, and do you see that too, Brian? Uh, in over the last few years, uh, have there been there are more, more options for customers? Yeah, I certainly think there are a lot more options. Um, Rachel mentioned like chat and different things like that. Yeah. That is a huge channel nowadays where people, they're busy. They're busy in their lives, right? And so sometimes they can continue to do what they need to do instead of hanging on a phone line or whatever it may be. They can have a chat conversation while they're continuing to, to work. One thing that we've noticed recently with Ring Central is um, SMS and texting has become a really important thing, even if it's just setting up a, a future call or something like that. But the, that initial engagement coming through an SMS has become almost paramount and almost uh, the first thing that happens nowadays, which is a shift from where we used to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess, uh, Rachel, that um, we've got SMS and texting, but people still want that sort of human connection, don't they? Uh, but I guess that they, they, they want it in different ways than before. Are you seeing that? Well, yes, because uh, especially as we move more into Gen Z or even, you know, on the border of Gen X millennial where I am, uh, we don't like the phone that much. We'll we'll want it when we really, really need a human and need it fast. But most of us, how we do 90% of our communication with other humans is via text message these days. Okay. And again, even if that can be misinterpreted, sometimes it is what we think of when we get a text, we think that's a person. We don't think, oh, that's a bot, that's a machine, you know, something wants my money in some way. We The automatic first reaction is this is someone I need to respond to immediately because this is a person. Absolutely. And that leads me on to, on the previous uh, webinar in this series, uh, one of the panelists was from Disney. And uh, we were talking about using social media as customer service channels, which I find really fascinating because we've got TikTok and Instagram and Twitter. I've used Twitter, for example, you know, to get in contact with a, an airline company about something. Um, but are you seeing co um, companies using social media for customer service channels and how are they finding that? Um, I've been seeing people use Twitter more so than something like Instagram or things like that because what you post on Twitter then becomes public about the company. Yeah. So they kind of have to uh, respond in that way there. Um, sometimes a little bit of Facebook, but I really have seen that most on Twitter and I've used it too. You know, when my cable goes out or my internet goes out, uh, I, I try and call the company and I get, you know, a machine. I call, you know, I do Twitter and two minutes, oh, you know, we're sorry, we're looking at it and we'll get back to you. You know, we'll call you back. So um, they get back faster that way. Now, I do think Twitter is a great, um, a great service channel. Yeah, exactly. But it could be, it could be dangerous, you know, so I've got for my 100,000 followers, you know, I'm angry and I'm in that, I'm, I'm angry about the flight delays and I'm telling everyone about yeah. this airline company's very poor customer service and 100,000 people and the rest uh, can see that. So the stakes are, 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 are raised much higher, aren't they, with social media as a channel? I really think it's taken, it's taken a life of its own a bit where... Right. Several years ago, it was it was the Google reviews or the reviews posted on various websites yeah. or whatever, and there was some some lagging between behind that. But nowadays, it's almost immediate. So, and to your point, Andy, there are so many individuals, influencers out there that have such an impact on perception and and yeah. business that I think a lot of companies have to monitor those social channels very very closely to make sure that they are engaging with any potential issue. I also think it's also a great opportunity for business though. They can, they can engage in those channels in, in a way that 
can show support, can sh- show some empathy and some things like that too, where um, a lot of it is behind the scenes, but when you're out on the public stage, you can say, oh, let me take care of that. And you can post to it and you can show, you can demonstrate that you're actually fixing the problem. Yeah, and that's part of how people perceive your customer brand and your and your employer brand. You know, if people are going to come and work for you as well um, with my HR hat on. So, it, you know, it can be part of the story, can't it? I'm a very public one. And actually, you could probably turn certain customer service issues into, into the positive, like you said, Brian, which would be, which would be very good. For sure. Um, in a recent um, Ring Central report, it stated that the first step to creating a strong customer experience is to create an incredible employee experience. So, in other words, if your employees are happy, they'll be more willing to make your customers happy. So a question for both of you is, you know, what can companies do to improve both employee and customer experience? Rachel? Well, this is 100% my wheelhouse because <laughs> uh, everything I teach takes it down to uh, treating your employees really well, understanding their journey and making your company a part of their story and vice versa. And when that happens, it's just mutually beneficial for everyone. But when you get that buy-in that they're really involved in the company, that what they do matters and makes a difference from day to day, they knock themselves out for you. I know that's how I am when I'm treated well with respect, yeah. given the authority to you know go do my thing. And if there's an issue, pivot. Uh, you know, I know I work 10 times as hard as if someone's like, all right, I'm watching your every move. You have to do it my way. Um, so I have found my, my employees just, oh, they're amazing. They just knock themselves out because they understand that they are given that freedom and customers feel it too. They feel when, when you yeah. have somebody happy serving you or someone who really cares it, you know, that, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, and then the, the converse is also true, isn't it? Um, uh, customers, I'm sure, can detect when the employee they're speaking to on the phone or or whatever isn't in a good place with their with their employer. You detect a little bit of uh, people aren't, you know, going the extra mile, maybe. Absolutely. I also think there's a, an element of education, right? When when you have a support team that's well educated or has the resources readily available to answer a question, where they don't feel an added sense of pressure of saying, oh, I don't know where to go to even find this kind of information, or I don't know how to answer this question or whatever it may be. If they're, if they're given one empowerment, like Rachel said, empower to solve the problem, but also the resources that they need to really understand, dig in and find the solution to the problem is very, very important. And I think that's part of it too. When they feel confident that they have what they need to answer the customer's uh, question or problem, that's empowering as well because they yeah. know that they can make it happen. And there's a sense of pride when you are able to to support someone and, and figure out their, their problem and, and get past it and get them on their way. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying is that you need to empower employees to make the right call with the customer and you know to trust them a little bit. Yeah, and and support them with the resources they need. No, that's fantastic. So I've spent a lot of time um, working on digital transformation programs, designing services internally. So, for example, HR, finance, these kind of processes. And I'll I'll give you a little anecdote. I was uh, designing services with a a very um, well-known supermarket and department store in the UK, you know, 80,000 employees. And we were designing the internal services, if you like, the employee services. So I'm working with an organization that's famous for its uh, high street customer service. Yet internally, the service was not so good. So my challenge was to say, look, how can we channel some of that external customer service with our own employees? And I think we made some inroads, right? I'm not going to tell you which uh, department store this is, but I think we made some inroads in capturing that. So it it works both ways too, doesn't it? Absolutely. And by the way, I mentioned the uh, Ring Central Long Live Customer Service Report, uh, which you will be able to access in the attachments below. But I enjoyed reading it. Lots of uh, uh, facts and figures and insights to, to read there. So my next question is, knowing is one thing and delivering is another. 
So what have you found to be the biggest obstacle to delivering a successful customer experience? Rachel, spill the beans. <laughs> you know, um, like you said, knowing is very different than reality, which is, uh, you know, often why I talk about customer success on the internet and customer success in real life. Uh, you know, and it's the same with, with customer service, with support. Products don't always work perfectly. Um, there are bugs. Anyone in, who works in tech knows that there are bugs in all products. It's going to happen sometime. Yeah. Your internal processes will not always be perfect. And uh, our, our human brains design these. And there will be things that we don't see. So things will get in the way. You know, they'll be clunky. It's really just being able to pivot to, to raise your hand and say, that was my bad. I'm so sorry. You know, we had a little bug. We all know yeah. how that goes. I have had so much sympathy from other tech people. Thankfully, I've worked mainly B2B. Um, but from other tech people being like, oh, we've had the worst experience with this. So part of that is having a realistic expectation that things are not going to go perfectly and to have a plan for when they don't. No, that's great. And, and I guess what you're saying as well is to be honest, you know, to yeah. admit to, to admit that um, sometimes the products will have glitches and to be comfortable with that um, as well. The best experiences I've had too are, are those where the support person, the customer success person, whoever I'm speaking with shows empathy for me, right? They, they try right. to understand what the problem is. They're showing empathy. They recognize, as Rachel said, they recognize that there was something that came up. Maybe it's out of their control. Maybe it's not, whatever it may be, but they're showing empathy for it and delivering on that. I think that really ties into the previous question as well as yeah. if your employees are bought in and they understand where you're at and where you're going and they're confident in who they're or how they're supporting it, they can show that empathy and really deliver that in the moment. And, and that's a great segue from empathy to uh, chatbots that don't have empathy, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I want to turn our attention to the communication formats themselves. So how do you think the rise in text and video communications has changed the customer success game? Ooh, I love this one. Um, because it's so important, it's really allowed us to scale. And like I was mentioning before, people want to be able to self-serve when they can. It's yeah. going to be easier, you know, if, if you have an intuitive search function and, you know, knowledge library for people to, to navigate. Most of them will prefer to go that route first. You know, we're, we're brought up to, you know, you Google it first. So if they can do that on your website, that's always a nice, uh, a nice to have. The, the advent of uh, video with things like Loom uh, has been absolutely amazing for support materials. Uh, what I like to do is uh, what I call two minute videos. So take any sort of complex process, break it into parts, and then each one of those parts gets a couple two minute videos so that you're having sort of micro steps shown to you and talked over. Um, there are also programs that will turn those into knowledge articles for you as well, so that you then have people can see it, people can hear it, people can read it. They have all the ways that they could want to interact with it. And then of course, you still have a human that you can reach out to, but exactly. it covers the whole gamut. Chatbots, mm, you know, I'd, me personally, I'd rather be able to, to do a search. I'm more frustrated when I'm doing a chatbot and it's not getting me the results I want, but obviously it's, it works for some people or they would not still be around. Exactly, and I love the idea of taking a solution and turning it into a video because that's what people are consuming when they're when, in their spare time, when they're, when they're having fun, right? It's TikTok videos and, and a lot of their training and educational videos are really being condensed down into these one minute and two minute summaries, which as someone who communicates for a living, is really challenging, but if you get it right, yeah, well, people really get it, and then and then you can you know scale up. So that's fantastic. Um, and and Brian, what do you think uh, around that question around the use of text and video communications? Yeah, I think the world is changing, right? I think there is not just one avenue to reach customer support or things like that, and you businesses have to be aware of that. That there are a lot of different 
kinds of engagement that needs to happen. And it's not just a single channel. It's not just a phone, uh, a phone number on your website anymore. They need, a lot of people are wanting to interact in different ways. And so I think it's supporting kind of this omni-channel approach to things. I think there is a place for chatbots. I've had success with chatbots where I was saying, I just need to know where to go to get this. Would and you call a that signposting? Time- you know, kind of, you know, here's a link. Yeah, exactly. And I think the chatbots are great at that because if they're programmed properly, they can give you the link and I'd be like, great, that's all I needed. There are other things that are far more complex where I want to have a chat conversation with a human being so they can understand what my problem is or a phone call or even a video video meeting or whatever it can be. There's just different channels. I also think having videos, having a great support library and some of those things where you're self-aware of what the questions are probably going to be and having those posted out there. I think that's very, very helpful. So I think there's just a lot of different channels that need to be supported. People want to integrate or to integrate with this and communicate in different ways. And it's important to meet them where they are. And so listen, Brian, in the good old days, there were about three channels to manage. You know, we had emails, voice, I'm trying to think, what else, you know? So it was, it was really simple. Now today, I don't know how many you would estimate are normal in an organization, maybe five, 10, 20 different channels. So, you know, I might have a, a customer account, I don't know, with, with, a, with a product firm, but I've also got all the social media channels. Um, and we've got, I've got text, I've got all these different ways of interacting. I've got a particular problem. How on earth do you keep track of that one customer and all the different ways they're communicating with your company. How on earth do, do companies manage that? Well, when when I've run across that, uh, the way that we've handled it is through a customer success platform, something like a Gainsight, Catalyst, Tatango, any of those. Um, they basically have uh, integrations with most of the channels, or at least an API, where you can connect these things through an account number uh, to your various channels. Okay. So, you know, you, if there are app mentions on uh, on Twitter, you could have an automation that would direct it to that account. And this links up with things like Zendesk, where they can see as well what's going on with the customer. Everyone has that sort of 360 view there. Oh, that's great. So you have, so you pretty much have a good visibility of all the communications that a particular customer is raising with your company. Exactly. And you can use that to modify the health score. Uh, for example, if I have a certain number of communications, if it goes over a certain number of support communications, I'm going to start saying that's a risk because they shouldn't need us in a support capacity this often. So maybe we need to do a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more training or a little bit more engagement there. It, it really informs our strategy. No, that's great. And Brian, would you have any, um, any tips or advice for companies for managing this uh, situation? I mean, Rachel mentioned the software we can use, but any kind of tips or advice in this area? Yeah, I think there are a few things. Um, for example, I think there's customer contact center solutions that are like this now too. There's a lot of tech that's kind of starting to build into this space and however you're coming from it may change your strategy a little bit. Like contact center solutions nowadays, they're primarily like driven by phone, but they're becoming omni-channel. So they're looking at all of these different things. They're doing social listening, they're doing chat, they're doing text, they're doing all of these things and building these customer profiles like you mentioned, Andy. I think the the main tip that I would be would show is um, using the analytics. Rachel kind of alluded this to this too, is using the analytics to really understand how you're engaging with the customers. Who are these customers that are coming back? A lot of these insights can change the way that you do your processes internally to improve things and make things better. So take advantage of the analytics, understand what it's telling telling you, and then as the manager or as the person overseeing that, it ultimately comes back to that human element again, right? Like the the human has to implement those things. They have to take the analytics, look and see what's going on and implement a change. Well, that's great. So I imagine you've got this 24 seven dashboard um, with all the different sort of queries coming in, the, the status, uh, and that gives you some great information for improving the service, I, I, I bet. 
Absolutely. I think data is so important nowadays and it's becoming so a part of everything we do. Like the simplest tasks are tracked and looked at. Um, but nowadays there's, there's the real time, like as it's coming in, you can see it as it's coming in and you can compare that to historical because we're tracking everything and storing data so that we can see what's happened in the past. And the combination of those two different elements is really, really important. Now, that's great. And it, it helps me um, lead on to the next question, because I love looking at future trends, looking in the crystal ball and thinking about what's coming up in the world of work. Look, I look at demographics, um, tech trends from blockchain um, to AI and how we use data um, and how different types of organization structures are emerging. So I like to uh, keep an eye on things. But um, looking into the future, what do you see as um, possible emerging trends to watch. Uh, for example, do you think we're going to get these chatbots that use our use the data to anticipate our needs, or is that going too far? What do you think the trends are? I haven't heard that one, though. <laughs> it's interesting. You know, I'm not averse to it. If there are logical connections, absolutely. Why not? Um, I think. Oftentimes we oversimplify what leaps the human brain makes, you know, do you ever start off talking about like, oh, I took a course the other day and then, you know, three minutes later, you're thinking about a duck. It doesn't, <laughs> it, but you got there in, in some sort of connection, but it's not going to make sense to anybody else. Um, what I think is going to be the next, uh, the next big thing, at least I hope is machine learning through natural language processing that can take customer feedback that's qualitative and turn it more quantitative. Because that's something that we really struggle with, uh, you know, because customers will write in all sorts of text, you know, that is qualitative. It's very diff difficult to categorize that in a way that isn't manual right now. Um, and to, to catalog all those things without repetition. Um, so I've seen people starting to get it. I don't know that anyone's really nailing that yet, but starting to do things with word clouds and words that are associated yeah. with one thing and another. I think that once that really gets nailed down, oh my gosh, it's going to be so huge. That's going to be rich, isn't it? I've yeah. seen pilots of that internally. So mm -hmm. asking employees what they think about uh, about working for a company. And, uh, you know, it's analyzing the... Uh, the, the text responses. So it's great working here, but, you know, mm -hmm. um, I wish I was paid more. I wish I had more vacation or whatever. And it's interesting that you could use that text to look at something called co-occurrence. If people are actually saying something negative about uh, working, what it's like to work there, what's the secondary thing that they're, they're mentioning, if at all? And, and using that kind of um, um, uh, AI to actually work out what are the issues within our employer base? And of course, that, that would apply to customers too. It could be really rich, couldn't it? And that is the exact problem that people are having right now. Uh, if you think about when a customer is leaving, a lot of the time they'll say, it's been absolutely amazing. We've had such a great experience with you. And we're going somewhere else. <laughs> so you have no idea why they've left. So the, the AI will be like, that was a great interaction. You're like, was it though? <laughs> yeah, because you really want to know the second piece, which is because I found somewhere better and cheaper or, you know, I'm leaving the country. You know, yeah. you want to know that, don't you? Yeah. I do think I think AI and machine learning is going to become a bigger and bigger part of all of these things. Um, I do think there, as Rachel has pointed out, <clears throat> excuse me, that there is a human element that can't be matched yet and hopefully never. But we'll <laughs> we'll get to that point later on. But. Um, <clears throat> I do think that if we can use machine learning and UAs, use AI to support the rep, whoever is having that interaction, and there are tools out there already that are starting to serve these things up where it's listening into a conversation, it's helping to prompt different questions, or it's delivering certain scripts, or it's delivering content or information that may be applicable to the conversation. I see that as the main goal of the AI and the machine learning is to support the rep, not necessarily to do the rep's job, yeah. but in order to like support them so that they can do the right thing, have the right content, information, whatever to serve to the customer. It's always going to be, in my opinion, the human element that's going to 
be the core of this that they need to yeah still trust trust what they're going to be served but in the right way i think that's great so we've got the data we've got the algorithms it's doing the legwork for us right it's doing the number crunching it's looking for patterns and then it's coming up with something useful to uh, a worker that says look in this kind of call here, are, here, are, here here's the recommended course of action for 88 percent of interactions right um, you know, unless X, you know, this kind of thing. So it gives you sort of this sort of uh, these kind of insights. I think that's really interesting. Of course, there's issues around uh, data privacy, uh, who, who, who has access to that data and what it's used for. But I think that's um, a general issue around the use of technology across every domain, really. Um, so uh, no, that's really fascinating. Um, and I think um, a question for you is, um, what are companies um, getting wrong in customer services um, that you see most commonly? Is it the wrong tools or the, the poor implementation of them? Is there anything that you think uh, you see uh, most commonly with, with organizations, Rachel? Uh, you know, I think it's, it's two things. One is silos. So you have the support team getting all this information, solving problems, and then it never goes anywhere else in the organization. So anyone else who touches the customer has no idea and the customer gets frustrated with that. Um, it doesn't seem like a big thing, but it, as an experience, you want to feel like the company knows your account. And the other thing is over relying on things like chat bots and things like that. Well, you need to know how much it solves because if your customer can't reach anyone and they're frustrated with this chat bot and they've sent an email and they just feel like they're nowhere, customers won't stay because you have good customer support, but they will leave if you have bad customer support. Right. No, that's a, that's a great insight. Um, and Brian? I think it's the prioritization, right? Like, I think if you if your organization prioritizes customer support, customer engagement, those types of things, I actually think it does lend to loyal customers because they are willing to engage with you because they know that they're going to get their problem solved. They're, they're going to have a good experience with those types of things. I have a lot of brands that I'm loyal to because they've helped me out in a pinch yeah. when things didn't go the right way and they delivered and they delivered in the perfect way. And it's helped me to say like, look, I can trust them. I know that even if something comes up, they're going to help me out. So I think it's that prioritization. I do think <clears throat> part of that prioritization is making sure that you have the right tools. Yeah. If, if your support team is not given the right tools and they're having to kind of piece things together and it's, it just makes for a bad experience for the, for the employee and for the customer. So Delivering with the right tools is important as well. Well, that's fantastic. And you, you've turned uh, that question around to some positive and constructive tips uh, for our listeners today. So be really careful of those organizational silos. You know, find out where the blockages are, try and remove them. And uh, as Brian said, prioritize um, the areas that you need to focus on, which is fantastic. Um, well, listen, we're coming to the end of our, of our talk today. I've really enjoyed it. And I guess um, if I was to summarize, I think we're, we're, we're using technology in really smart ways. So we're using technology for the right kinds of transactions so that we're allowing the human interaction at the right places. And that seems to be what we're using this technology for, which is fantastic. So we can enable trust, so we can enable effective communications. I think that's really exciting. I'm looking to the future, getting the machines to help us improve this is a very, uh, it's gonna help our human interaction. So, you know, I, I think that's a really positive thing that I've taken uh, from this call and I hope uh, listeners have today. Um, so um, listen, thank you for attending the third webinar in Ring Central series, The Future is Calling, How to Keep in Touch with Tomorrow's Work Needs. So a big thank you to Brian and Rachel for sharing their perspectives, their examples and their insights today. Um, for more information, click the attachment section below and make sure to register for the next episode of the series. So hopefully we'll see you then.